very important, very, very, very important. We're going to be talking about the subject of the oneness of God again. And uh, I don't know that you can get too much of it this. I heard of a uh, man that left a very, very, very good church here in California, and he went down into the deep south, and he was there long, long, long time. And uh, he never heard anything about the oneness. Finally, it was taught one day, and he was so excited, and he went to the pastor, and he said, yeah, I try to touch on that at least once a year. Uh, this is something that needs more than touched on. And then also, all of the classes today, all of the other classes today, from the youngest child up, are being taught on this subject, so that when they get on the bus, they're all talking about the same thing. And etc. We're talking about the oneness of God, the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, to talk about the oneness of God, you have to go back. The Jews were those that that God revealed Himself to, and as the one God. The Jews are the heralders of the monotheistic message um, in a world of confusion. And uh, this goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Abraham, of course, before this, knew there was one God. But when they were given the law by Moses, it states now, These are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. Deuteronomy, if you'll remember, is the fifth book of the Torah, the fifth book of the First five books of Moses, first five books of the Bible, and Deuteronomy is basically a recapitulation of all that they had been taught in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers by way of commandments. And so in the rehearsing of this, uh, you're going into a land to possess it. These are the commandments and statutes which God commanded to teach you. Verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. I don't only command thee, that is thou. I command thy son and thy son's sons all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. This is not a one generational teaching. This is on to every generation. Every generation was to get this and to receive this. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it that it may be well with thee. If you want things to be well with thee, to go well with you, that you may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So keep these commandments if you want life to keep going forward in a proper, good, blessed manner. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is a reason we have this heralded on our wall. The Lord our God is one Lord. This is the capstone if you will, key commandment of the entire Old Testament. All things spring forth from this. All things are centered with this. Without this, things do not hold up or consist, or, to be honest, they don't really make full, complete sense because there is one God from which emanates everything including how things ought to operate, especially his highest creation, that is mankind. And when Jesus was asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? This is the verse he quoted. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love him with all your heart, soul, might. And there's one of him. Just one. Just one. Can I, can I stop here and tell you that 
um, it is this edict that was burnished, branded, uh, ingrained through a host of circumstances, let alone the scripture, into the hearts of the Jewish people. One of the largest, biggest reasons that Judaism uh, from the third century on has had an antipathy against Christianity is because they know this verse. They know, they've been taught, they teach, they embrace. Now there's all specters of Judaism and, and all heights and lengths and breadths and depths and, and uh, shallownesses and all kinds of things. But if they believe in God, they believe there is one God, period. And they choke on the doctrine of the Trinity. They choke on it. They, they, that's, 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 they, they step back and they cannot embrace that. This is one reason when Napoleon Bonaparte, in his efforts to unite um, his empire... And, uh, and he knew that the Jewish peoples were and could be a uh, blessing, as it were, financially. One of the things that he instituted was a recreation of the Sanhedrin, the 70 that was, that was alive in the days of Jesus and the days of the Apostle Paul. And so Napoleon resurrected the Sanhedrin, a European Sanhedrin, and, and it, it gripped the Jewish people. I mean, they just, they knew that it was a political ploy. They really did. But just the thought that there could be another Sanhedrin court and another ruling body of 70, as far as the Jewish peoples, it was, it was a, it was so tempting for them to embrace that. But one of the edicts they put forth is, we can do this and we will accept this. How be it? We will not accept the doctrine that there are three persons in the Godhead. They let them know. If we have to accept that in order to play this game, if I can use those terms, that's not the terms they used, they said, forget it. We will not do it. It has to have the hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Well, that's just a carryover. It's the way it is. They were taught this, that there is but one God. It is huge with them. Now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus Christ, okay, we're teaching on the oneness of God, and who Jesus really is, the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus made this statement. He said, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, rest assured that the man Christ Jesus lived. Rest assured that the man Christ Jesus had a father. Rest assured that Joseph was not that father. If Joseph was that father, from a host of other things, he could not have been the Messiah uh, because the house of Joseph from the days of King Jeconiah had a curse upon it. Jeremiah the prophet placed a grievous, hideous curse upon the house of David through the lineage of Jeconiah because he was so wretchedly vile, so contrary, so the breaking of commandments meant nothing to him. And so a curse came forth, basically said, right, this man childless, though he did have children and children's children. But he said, no one ever reigning on the throne through the lineage of Jeconiah, will ever prosper. Well, Jesus Christ, if he were the son of Joseph, Joseph was the son of Jeconiah through lineage. Had he been the son of Joseph, he could not prosper. There was a curse on his house. He could not prosper. He had to be born of a virgin to escape, to to be of the house of David, who was from Mary, but to escape the curse of Jeconiah, he could not be the son of David. So he could rule and reign because he had a father who was the spirit of almighty God. Now, in, in this 
uh, lessons here. I'm going to um, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to take my time, and uh, and 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 uh, I really I'm just going to take my time because I want us to get this. Now we are serving a God. I got this because it's easier. All right. You've seen me do this 10,000 times. When I'm dead, Joel, have at it. Man, just do it all the time. It don't matter to me. Everybody do it. It's a great deal to teach if you're doing home Bible studies. God's a spirit. A spirit has no blood. God cannot die. He is a spirit. He has no blood. God tempteth no man, neither indeed. God cannot be tempted, neither indeed tempteth he any man. So he can't be tempted. He has no blood and he cannot die. So, how is he going to bring about salvation through a Messiah? God manifest in the flesh. How is he going to be of the son of David with the Coniah having a curse upon him? All of these things. So there is a virgin by the name of Mary. She is a spouse. That means heavily engaged. Uh, A spousal in those days meant you were engaged to be married. But the spousal was so binding that even though you had never known each other conjugally, you would have to obtain a divorce to break it up. So they were married, but not conjugally. That's what his spousal meant. And so she had not uh, yet uh, known him. This was not finalized. The Spirit of the Lord came upon her. The angel Gabriel pronounced to her she would have a child. She said, how can this be? I've never known a man. He said, that which shall be born in thee shall be conceived of the Holy Ghost. That is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a child of the Spirit of God, of the Holy Ghost. So that right there, the Holy Ghost is the Father. God is the Holy Ghost. God's a Spirit. And so God who could not bleed, who could not die, who could not be tempted, overshadowed Mary and he took on this body. I ain't always going to put on this glove, but Put this body on. He took on humanity. Okay? The reason I do this is when Jesus died on Calvary, the Spirit left the body. It left the body. The body was laid into the sepulcher. Then the Spirit re-entered that body, glorified it, and sat on the throne. Now, I had to say that to bring you this. Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. That which the man Christ Jesus taught, the works that he did. He said, The works I do, I do not of myself. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, And even his being, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. The Spirit of God produced all of this for the humanity. Okay? And no man knoweth the Son. In his day, in his time, then and there, people didn't know who he was. They may have thought. They may have wondered. They may have speculated. Okay? But but no man really knew who Jesus was. Now, he began to reveal himself. He began to reveal himself. But until it was revealed, nobody knew. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. The Father knew who he was, what he was. Okay? Neither knoweth any man the Father. Okay? Save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Can I tell you that to know who Jesus is, who know who the Father is, is a revelation. And if you're hungry today, Jesus will reveal to you today who he is, who the Father is. That's the purpose of this lesson. That's the purpose of the Word of God. 
And that's the purpose of his spirit. He wants you to know who he really is, who the Father is. So we're not going to get this except there is a revealing, and he does want to reveal. In the same chapter, verse 25, chapter 11 of Matthew, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now, If you're here today and you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that is the Spirit of God. And the Bible says that the Spirit is given unto us with measure. We have a certain measure of the Spirit of God. Okay? But the Scripture says of Jesus, He received the Spirit without measure. We have a measure. He had it, there was no measuring. Because as we shall see, in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So it was given unto Him without measure. But we have it with measure. So if you have the Holy Ghost, you can be praying, thanking God, even though He's living within you. He's living within you, but he's also beyond you. He's here. He's beyond the edge of the universe. He can fit the universe in his back pocket, if you got the picture. He's a big God. By him all things consist. So so this big, mighty God, this Alpha and Omega, this beginning and the end, this, this, this mighty God, amen, uh, is everywhere, but he's in us. But with measure, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he could talk... To the Father, the Father was in Him. The Spirit was in the flesh. The divinity in the humanity that He had created in order to live in and work in. So the man, Jesus, said, I thank Thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because Thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. There's a lot of of a of, of, uh, uh, seemingly wise, prudent, sharp, even highly educated, and there's nothing wrong with an education, just like there's nothing wrong with a car, as long as you use it right. Okay? So, but if we don't use things right, it doesn't do us any good. So these things you've hid from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. So, he wants to reveal... And he wants to reveal to anybody that is hungry enough, simple enough, not too smart for God. Now, you can be a genius and get the revelation, but there's got to be a humility there. He's revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Why? God resisteth the proud. He draws nigh to the humble. He lifts up the humble, but he resists pride. He, he he, he, he steps back from pride. Okay? But to the humble, to babes as it were. Amen. He will reveal himself. The single most important truth in the world. The single of all truth. The single most important truth in the world. It is not Einstein's E equals MC squared. It is not. The single most important truth in the world is not economic processes of... of, There's all kinds of things. The single most important truth in the world and the only truth that's going to matter when this thing wraps up, the only thing that's really going to matter, is the truth about who Jesus really is. And personally whether we're living for him or not. That's the most important thing in the entire world. The Bible says he that possessed as though he possessed not. You can you could you could be William Randolph Hearst and own Hearst Castle. When you breathe your last, it's gone. He that possessed things when he's dead, it's as if he never possessed anything. Because this life is so brief and fleeting and short and when it's over Eternity is endless. And so this little flash in the pan is nothing compared to the eternal 
endless, infinite ages. So he that possessed as though he possessed not. He that were married as though he were not married. This is what the Apostle Paul tells us. So what we take out into eternity is by far the only thing that really ultimately matters. And so the truth about who Jesus really is, is the most important truth of all ages. Okay? Why is this? John 14 and 6, Jesus saith unto him, speaking of Philip, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is the greatest, single, most powerful truth who Jesus is. He said, I am the way. There are not multiple ways. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. People sometimes will look at us and say, you folks are highly exclusionary. You ain't seen nothing. You want to talk about exclusionary. Let's go to the ministry of Jesus. He said, I'm it. Do you understand everything that Jesus is excluding? He is excluding Hinduism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Mohammedism. He's excluding all aspects, all other gods. Dagon, Ashtaroth, Chemosh, everything. He said, I'm it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the single most important truth is who Jesus is because he makes this claim. And I accept his claim. I believe his claim. Totally. Okay? Now, so the claim. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So let's step back and let's look at the the Jews who believed here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This truth that they embraced that set them apart from every other nation and peoples in the world. Matthew 2.10. He states, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Now, we're living in a world that that uh, uh, many many people. It's, it's it's breathtaking to me. It is it is the concept. Do you understand how much faith you got to have to believe evolution? You talk about they say, oh, you got to have faith to believe in God, brother. You talk about faith. The faith you have to have to believe in evolution when there are aspects of evolutionary theory, and that all it is, it's a theory, okay? There are things that they absolutely hit stumps. Even Charles Darwin, he laid it all out, all this. There was, and somebody asked him a question, he says, I have no answer. He knew there was none. No evolutionist has ever even attempted, nor do they try, just this one question of of tens of thousands. How did the eye evolve? The eyeball is seeing from protoplasm and all this stuff. How and why would an eye ever evolve? Not one evolutionist ever, anytime, anywhere, attempts that because they know it doesn't fit anything. That's just one little question. And so they say, well, it was this, and it grew and it mutated, and this and that. When did the eye start? And how did it get started in all these creatures? It just popped up. Well, really? 
What about God just forming us and breathing into us the breath of life? Hallelujah. It takes more faith to believe in, in evolution than it does in God. Trust me. Okay? Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Isaiah 63, verse 16. Doubtless thou art our Father. But understand, Malachi 2.10, Jews believe one God created us. Doubtless, Isaiah 63, 16, thou art our Father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us. Okay, this is multi, multi, multi generations down from their father Abraham. He's ignorant of them. They are. But God, you are our father. And Israel acknowledge us not. Jacob, that's Jacob's other name. Because we're multi generations separated. But thou, O Lord, art our father. You ultimately... I know it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but God, you're our father. We have one father. God created us. Oh, Jehovah, thou art our father. And, and I've told this many times, but L-O-R-D in all caps in the Old Testament is uh, the King James translator's way. Uh, 99% of the time they translated the term that we call Jehovah into L-O-R-D in all caps, Lord. O Jehovah, Thou art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. So this Jehovah God, and this is important, He's not only our Father. We have one God. He's our Father. He is also our Redeemer. His name is from everlasting. So you got to remember this. Jehovah God, L-O-R-D caps, Jehovah is our Father. He is our Redeemer. If we get redeemed, it's going to be Jehovah that redeems us. He's the Redeemer. Okay? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 22. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, O Jehovah God, and for there is none like thee. You're great, Jehovah. There is none like thee. Neither is there any God beside thee. So next to Jehovah, there is no God beside him. There's no other God throughout the endless, endless universe and beyond. There's no God beside thee, and there's also no God next to thee. It's Jehovah all by himself. According to all we have heard with our ears, and can I say, read with their eyes. Amen. There is one Jehovah God There's no God next to him. None next to him. Isaiah 43 and 10. He wants to nail this fact down to us. It's it's big. This is big deal with God. Isaiah 43, 10. He's speaking to his people Israel. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, saith the Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen. So Israel... You're my witnesses, and you are my servant that I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. It doesn't get more singular than that. You are my witnesses. You are my servant. I chose you. I want you to know me. I want you to believe me, and I want you to understand I want this to get in your understanding. I am He. Not I am them. I am He. It's as singular as you can get. Before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. I'm He. I'm it. There's not a God before me. And there's not one coming. Before me, there's no God formed. Also, I'm your Redeemer. Neither shall there be any after me. I 
even I am the Lord. I, even I, am the Jehovah. And beside me, there is no Savior. There's no Savior to my right. There's no Savior to my left. There's no Savior anywhere out yonder. I'm it all by myself. I am your God. There's one. I'm your Father. I'm your Creator. I'm your Redeemer. I am your Savior. There's no Savior to the left of me. There's no Savior to the right of me. So whenever you see a depiction of God in a triism or three personages of, say, uh, an old man with a beard, and then there's a young man to his right and a, and a, and a, and a dove to the left. And they say, this is the Trinity and this is God made up of three persons. God did not draw that picture. You can rest assured God did not draw that picture. This is the picture that God is drawing. There is one God, one Father, one Redeemer, one Savior. There's no God before Him. There's no God after Him. There's no God to the left of Him. There's no God to the right of Him. There's no God coming. There's no God passed away. He said, I'm it. I'm the Redeemer. I'm the Savior. I'm the Father. I'm the Creator. I'm it. Beside me, there is no Savior. Now, that's language that the Jews can understand. Because they are monotheistic. There is one God. Isaiah 44, verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord, the Jehovah, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am not only Israel's King, I am Israel's Redeemer. So, I'm the King of Israel, I'm the Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Now, do you, do you understand? God is driving this point home. He, why is He driving this point home? Over and over and over again. And, and when I give you the list here, please understand, I'm just scratching the surface. I am just scratching the surface of the multi-scriptures that God depicts Himself. One, 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 one. Okay? Verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Is there a God beside me? And you know you've heard me state this. I'm about to tell you, there, there is one thing God doesn't know. There's one thing. I know He's om, omniscient. He knows everything, everything. But there's one thing God doesn't know. And in that regards, there are people that feel like they're smarter than God. Because they know things that He apparently doesn't know. There's one thing God does not know. Okay? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. That's the one thing He doesn't know. Is there a God beside me? There is no God. I know not any. That's the one thing he doesn't know. There's no God beside me. I don't know any God beside me. So if when people tell you, well, there's a, there is another personage next to the Father. He's, you know, he's to the right of the Father. And then the, the, the Holy Spirit's on, to the left of the Father. You know, to the right, to the left. There, there is a God beside him. Then what you're saying is you know more than God. Because God said, I don't know anybody to the left or to the right. There's no other God beside me. I am the Redeemer. I'm it. Nehemiah 9, 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou art Jehovah alone. All by yourself. Thou, this God all by himself. Thou hast made the heaven, made heaven. 
the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are in, the seas and all that there is, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything in the earth, in the oceans. God alone made it. Thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven worshipeth thee. God all by himself made everything. All by himself. Now, let's go to the New Testament. We're dealing in the New Testament now. That's Old Testament. Smidgens of host, a plethora of verses where God deals with who he is how many of them there is, and he's it, all things. But in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, ah, this is written to Christians, to saints of God, but to us there is but one God. So in the New Testament, to the Corinthian saints, there is but one God, the Father. One God the Father, of whom are all things. Okay, Nehemiah 6, all things in heaven, in earth, all things, the stars of the heaven, the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, all things are from the Father. To us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. All right? And one Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can get your Strong's. And, and Joel went through this the other day, gave a fascinating list of, of many of the times that this word and is translated. It, it, the Greek is chi. And it's translated and or even. And he read a very, very extensive list where this word chi is translated even. And so it was up to the King James translators how they did it. Okay? But this word, do you remember how many times it was? Did you say 67? 140 sometimes it's translated even. So, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. How about even one Lord Jesus Christ? Because this Jehovah God Creator has no blood to shed. He is a spirit. He tempts no man, cannot be tempted, and cannot die. But this one Jehovah God said, I'm the Redeemer. Beside me there is no Savior. So if this Jehovah God who cannot bleed, who cannot die, who cannot be tempted, said He is the Savior, there's no Savior next to Him. I even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. And He's going to become the Savior. He is the Redeemer. Then what does He do? He overshadows Mary in her womb, produces a child. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So through the auspices of this humanity, he can now taste death. He can shed the only innocent blood. He can be in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So to us... New Testament Christians, there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, even or and one Lord Jesus Christ, okay, by whom are all things, and we by Him, okay. So he's saying that Jesus Christ did the same thing as the Father, because Jesus Christ is the Father made manifest. When you see Jesus Christ of the New Testament, you are seeing Jehovah God of the Old Testament made flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And as we shall see, 
Jesus said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Why sayest thou then, show us the Father? Knowest thou not that the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Okay, this is one God who became flesh in order to save us. He didn't send an emissary. He, 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 it is for us. Now we read this in the Amplified. Yet for us there is only one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, for whom we have and for whom we have life, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom and by whom are all things, and through and by whom we ourselves exist. Jesus Christ, this one God, is one in the same. Uh, contemporary English, we have only one God. One God. He is the Father. He created everything, and we live for Him. Jesus Christ is our only Lord. Everything was made by Him, and by Him life was given to us. Now we're going to see this. How can Jesus Christ be the Creator? I thought He was born in Bethlehem because He is God manifest in the flesh. And as God, He created everything. All right? And this, this is just, I'm closing. In fact, musicians begin to come for this uh, day I'm closing. God's a spirit. And at one time, there was no height, no depth, no length, no breadth. He's, it's just Him. And he's going, to be, he's going to create. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Okay? We've done this many times, but it doesn't bother me. I want us to get it. For just a minute, and don't go to sleep on me. Close your eyes. Repetition's the mother of all teaching. Close your eyes. Don't go to sleep. Close your eyes. Pretend you're God. No height, depth, length, breadth. Just you. And everybody say, let there be light. One more time. Open your eyes. Woo, looky. So God said, let there be light. God spoke. And it came into existence. Now, what came first? The light, the creation, or the fact that He spoke it? The Word. This is why in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made which was made. And the Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. That which walked among us was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. Anybody glad there is one God? It's not a mystery. Let's stand. It's not a mystery. It's a revelation. It's a beautiful, beautiful truth. The most important truth. This God, this one God loved us so much. He would taste our pain. He would taste our temptations. He would make a way to shed perfect, innocent blood. And then resume sitting on a throne. Glorified. Having purchased and obtained a bride for himself. Anybody glad we're part of that bride today? What a God. What a God. What a God. Let's lift our hands and love him.